just declare and decree over you that everything that you have need of right now, even as my dad was preaching earlier and sharing earlier, the I am has come down. Come on, receive that that you need right now. The I am, everything that you need is in the I am. Receive it. Your healing, your deliverance, your breakthrough, your favor, whatever it is you have need of it, receive it right now in the name of Jesus. The Lord's releasing it to you. Thank you, Lord. Just begin to pray in the Holy Spirit and release that right now. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. I just want you and nothing else. Nothing else. Nothing else will do. I just want you and nothing else. Nothing else. Nothing else will do. How many want him today? How many desire him more than anything, more than the breath that you breathe? That's the way we have to be. We have to say, God, I need you more than anything. Lord, today we just tell you, Lord, we want you. We need you. We don't need a man. Lord, it's not about Joshua. It's about Jesus. It's about you, Lord. What do you want to do? What do you want to say? We open our hearts to receive it now. In the mighty and matchless name of Jesus. How many know that he'll meet every need? How many know he'll lift every burden? And he'll destroy every yoke? How many are thankful for his anointing this morning? Come on, give the Lord a shout of praise. Oh, come on, lift up a shout of praise. Amen. Before you're seated, look at look about two or three people and say, you're in for it. You're in for it. Amen. Thank you. Praise God. Amen. Thank you, guys. So good. Amen. It's good to see my sister is here and my brother in love and my great niece. You've been at Disney? having a good time. I'm so blessed that y'all came. And then it looks like uh, Taylor has brought the baby to the house today. <laughs> so is this her first time to church or she been before? All right. I was thinking I was taking her for the apostolic message right now. That's all right. She gets to be on one of the first ones, right? Amen. So awesome. Good to, I look forward to meeting you, my friend. Uh, I know that if you Earned her respect and love. You're a great man. Amen. She's, she, you married up when you married her. Amen. So what a mighty woman of God. Amen. Are you glad to be in the house today? I've just, I just love all of you and have missed you, Prophet Kirkland Minerva. My goodness, you guys need to reproduce yourself and send somebody to help me up in Texas. Amen. I got Prophet Noah helping me, but I'm sure he's saying amen behind the camera right now, wanting somebody to come help us out up in there. <laughs> uh, so good to see all of you. I start calling names. I'm going to be uh, calling all of you the whole message, but I've got to catch a flight in just a few hours. I got to be at the airport, and so uh, I'm going to get to it today and we'll just see what Holy Spirit wants to do. Amen. You can, you can sit down and receive my friend. Thank you so much. What happens is when somebody plays, I just want to sing and worship and I can't. Yeah. New mic. Yeah. Praise God. I heard it go out. So you're on it. Good to see you. Coach Megan. Yeah. Miss, miss all of y'all. Yeah, I, I came in. It's been a whirlwind. We came in Thursday. We drove three hours. I got in, changed clothes. They were already started service, preached in Bradenton um, on Thursday night. Then I drove about two or three hours to Palm Bay, 
and got there in time to change and go right in and preach. Uh, Friday, yesterday, I had a little bit of off time and spent some time with Pastor Mac and Dr. Yune, and that was awesome. And then now here we are. My wife said, my wife is watching. She sends her love, everybody. Everybody go, aw. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We, we give you a hug. Her and Sela are on on the couch right now, along with uh, Benjamin, I believe, if he's not out playing the drums. He loves to play the drums all the time. But if he, they're in there, I love you. And, and uh, they send their love. But my wife said last night, she says, I miss seeing you preach today. She said, you being off, that's not right. <laughs> <laughs> Saturday. I said, I needed some time off, Lord Jesus. All the flying and driving and getting where we were going is just some work. But all of you that are here, I miss getting to go to Disney with my family yesterday. I I just didn't have it in me to walk through those lines and, and the rain and the sweat and the whatever. I love y'all though. I'll hug y'all. Now, I know my sister's like, you should have come with me. <laughs> I love you, sis. <laughs> Amen. Well, I want to share with you some things today that I feel the Holy Spirit's put in my heart. And I'm actually here. I didn't come for Bradington. I didn't come for Palm Bay. I came here for you. And I tacked them on when they found out I was coming. They asked me if I would come minister to them. But the Lord spoke to me when I was here last time to come again in, in a matter of weeks to minister uh, to you. And then he's already spoken to me again to come again in January. So there's, um, I forgot to tell you that last night. <clears throat> I just introduced and invited myself back. <laughs> this is probably one of the only places I can do that, <laughs> my family. But uh, in January, I felt that I was supposed to come back, and we were talking last night. It was, uh, they, they, y'all put me up in such a nice place. Uh, this this uh, place is called the Celeste Four Star hotel. I think it's the only one on this side of town and it is so beautiful, but they had some loud live music last night, very loud. And we were trying to sit in the foyer and talk and strategize. And I told Pastor Mack at one time, I said, you're going to talk louder. I can't. He started almost preaching, <laughs> but anyhow, I forgot to say it in the midst of the noise last night, but I just feel a, a sense in my spirit of urgency for where God is taking the body of Christ and especially where he's taking us as a ministry, that there's some things that we have to set in place apostolically to uh, achieve that, to move forward. And I, I'm not everyone's apostle. I'm not every church's apostle. I'm sent to uh, some, and then there's some that, that don't receive me, and I'm not sent to them, but I do know I'm sent to you and so I feel that uh, Holy Spirit has put it in my heart to come in and out on a regular basis um, over the coming months as he say, sees fit ever so many weeks and just pour into you. And then uh, hopefully through this, we can begin to shift into that new season that you're talking about. How many believe there is a new season for the body of Christ? Now, I'm, I, I'm a little lighter skin than... Uh, Pastor Mac, and the last time I watched the video when I was here, it looked like I was an angel glowing. <laughs> my white hair and my face, you could barely see my pupils of my eyes. So I don't know if I need to come up there or come back, but if you see that in the cameras, y'all, is that what it looks like? Do I need to come up and get out from under the light? Well, that, let's try it. Can we move this? I got to thinking about that. I was trying to watch it earlier, and I know some people might have thought it was the glory, but uh, it wasn't the glory. It, it, was, it wasn't nothing to do with the glory. It was just all to do with me being so white. Is that better? Did it fix it? Did it fix it? Or Y'all are watching. I can stand over here. <laughs> You'll fix it. All right. Well, I don't, I don't want to uh, be long, but I believe it'll be strong in the name of the Lord. Amen. Let's stand to our feet. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Just for the reading of the word and in a time of prayer. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Go with me, if you will, to your passage that you're in, and then I'm going to take you to one more. Second Chronicles chapter 7 and verse 14. And then I'm going to uh, tie into it what I believe it's going to take, some of what it will take 
to see this happen. Second Chronicles chapter 7 and verse 14. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and forgive their sin and heal their land. Now go with me to Acts chapter 13. Thank you, Lord. Are you hungry for the word today? Acts chapter 13. And let's pick up in verse 2. There was some prophets and teachers and leaders that were gathered together, and let's see what they're doing. Acts 13 verse 2. As they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Spirit said, now separate to me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. Then having fasted, watch this, and prayed and laid hands on them, they sent them away. Verse 4, so being sent out by the Holy Spirit, they went down to Seleucia, and from there they sailed to Cyprus. Father, we ask you these next few minutes that you would just anoint our ears to hear your word, that you would cause these words not to just be information, but may there be an illumination and an impartation and activation so we can go forth from this place in a divine demonstration of your spirit. We ask, Father, that you would cause it to come farther than mental ascent and let it go deep down into our innermost being, and may there be a shift, and may there be a change, may there be an upgrade, shift us into that new season, upgrade us in the spirit from where we're at to where you want to take us to. Lord, your word declares that we're as we behold you, Lord, we're being changed into your image from glory to glory. So today, as we behold your face, let there be a shift. May we come up higher. May we go deeper. And everyone said, amen. Amen. Now let's try something out because some of y'all are acting like y'all are from the church of the Frigidaire. All right. It is cold up in here, so maybe that's why you're doing that, Uh, the frozen chosen. All right. So so why don't we try this? Say amen. Amen. Say hallelujah. Hallelujah. Say glory. Say mm mm-hmm. All right. Now, if you'll do that every once in a while or run around here like Mama Betty and say, oh, yes, he do or something, I'll feel like I'm in home today. All right. Come on, put your hands together and lift up a shout for the word of God. Amen. You may be seated. So, you know, in this ministry, we're passing babies, you know, in this ministry, we have In this ministry, we have uh, some pillars that we talk about, the apostolic, the prophetic, worship, and intercession. We know that. That's something Holy Spirit has put within us. If you're new to uh, Awake Florida, to this ministry, then uh, you need to know that. Part of who we are, we're called to be a house of worship. Say a house of worship. Secondly, we are called to be a house of prayer. Say a house of prayer. We are called to an apostolic ministry. Say apostolic ministry. So that means we're called to not just gather people, but to send people out into the harvest field. We are a sending agency. We are a spirit-filled aircraft carrier. Amen. Shake your coconut if you're with me this morning. We're called to send people out. We're not called just to get people and herd them in here like cattle every week and just do what we're doing. We want to see people deployed. So I want you to remember that. Write that word down, deploy. It's very important to send people out. And then we are called to be a prophetic people. Say prophetic. I didn't say pathetic. I said prophetic. We're called to be a people that will release the word of the Lord, to prophesy, to speak forth the word of the Lord, and help people to discover their destiny and help speak into a city or to a region the prophetic purpose of that city or region, to release the warning of the Lord, to release the correction of, come on, somebody, 
the prophetic ministry is not just about prophesying Jaguars and Cadillacs. The prophetic ministry is also to help warn the body of Christ, to keep the body of Christ out of the ditch and keep them, come on, in the center. Keep them on the narrow. Amen. The straight and narrow. So it's very important for us to understand our position. Now, there's this house is a five-fold ministry. Say five-fold ministry. So we believe in raising up apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. Amen. And we believe even if you're not one of them, that you are to be thoroughly equipped by them so that you will be able to function in maturity. You will function apostolically. You might not be an apostle, but you'll recognize that you were not just born. You've been sent for such a time as this. God sent you to your job, to your sphere of influence to make a difference. Can somebody say amen? And in that sent that sent assignment, you recognize who you are. And you recognize that you, you say to God, here am I, send me. Come on, how many will say, here am I, send me. Send me to my family. Send me to my friends. Send me to my coworkers. And then should the Lord desire, as you're faithful over a few things, he'll send you forth to even others. Maybe to move from Jerusalem or Orlando, can we say it that way, to Judea, to Samaria, and to the uttermost parts of the earth. As you're faithful in your metron, that's the Greek word for your measure of rule that God's given you, as you recognize where God's assigned you. So if you're faithful over your family, faithful to train up your children in the way that they should go, when they're old, they'll not depart from it. So as a dad, as a mom, you've been sent to make sure that your children are taught the ways of the Lord. Amen. That's your first ministry, to raise up your children in the fear and admonition of the Lord, to make sure that your children live a life that's holy before the Lord. Now, can I tell you, you can be good all you want, but that doesn't mean that you're going to make heaven. Good, A whole lot of good people will miss heaven. I live in the Bible buckle of America. I live in Texas now. And people there think they're saved just because they're in Texas. People think there's a lot of people in America that will tell you they're Christian because they're Americans. But it doesn't make you a Christian because you were born in America. What makes you a Christian was when you received Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. You, he is the way, the truth, and the life. There is no other way, no other God. He'll have no other gods before him. You say, why are you saying that? Because your sent mission as a dad, as a mom, is for you to help your children to recognize that. Otherwise, in their school or in college, some Dr. Dumbbell is going to teach them that there's another way. But can I tell you, there is no other way but Jesus. There is no other way. You say, well, that's just because you believe that because that was passed down from generation to generation. Yes, I do believe that's part of it, but it's not the only reason. I challenged every belief that I had. I, I, I tested this for myself, and I know that Jesus is the way. I searched the world over. Come on. Yeah, I've searched all over, and I've found that there is only one way, and it's Jesus. How many have ever prayed in the name of Jesus and saw healing come? I'm not talking about a, a facade or something you've created in your mind. I'm talking about reality. How many have ever almost been in an accident and you declared the name of Jesus and you averted that accident and you were delivered? How many have ever prayed for your child when they had a... a a fevered brow, and you declared the name of Jesus, and that fever left your child. I'm telling you, you can pray all day in Buddha's name. You can pray all day in Muhammad's name, and nothing's going to happen. You can pray in Allah's name, and, and nothing's going to happen. But when you pray in the name of Jesus, every demon will flee. Sickness must bow. I've tested this. Yeah, this is tested. I've tested it in Colombia. I've tested it in Guyana. 
I've tested it in Japan. I've tested it in Korea. I've tested it in Africa. I've tested it in England. No matter where I go throughout the nations, when I say the name of Jesus, whatever is in front of me has to get up and it has to go. No, no, it, it doesn't just work in America. This is not just an American religion. Come on. No, I... Yeah, I, I was in Guyana. They they woke me up at 3 in the morning. They brought me a girl that hadn't talked in over two years. I think it was 18 months to two years she hadn't spoke. She walked around like a zombie, foaming at the mouth. Woke me up at 3 in the morning to come out to pray for her. I was mad. I'll go ahead and tell you that. I wasn't happy that they brought me outside and woke me up at 3 in the morning. And it, and it was already hot. I was sleeping. I was sleeping under a net. Mosquitoes, I, one night my hand fell out of the net and it was bleeding because the mosquitoes ate on my hand all night long. So I can tell you this, I found myself out, out there in the morning in my shorts, in my tank top to go pray for these, these Hindus' daughter. And, they, and, the, and I, I looked at them and I was mad, I'll go ahead and tell you. I said, I said all right, will you divorce all other gods? If, if, when the Lord heals your daughter, will you divorce all other gods and say Jesus is the only God? Because Hindus have hundreds of gods. They got a God for everything. They got flags everywhere, and they're, they're worshiping everything. They believe in Jesus, but he's just one of them. No, he ain't. He's the only one. The other ones are demons and familiar spirits. And so I said, will you divorce all other gods when the Lord heals your daughter? They looked at me like this and said, yes. I said, I, I, I want to know because I'm, I'm not going to pray if you're not going to do it. Yes, we'll do it. All right. In the name of Jesus, come out of her. Loose her right now. That girl came back to her senses, stopped foaming at her mouth, called her mama for the first time in over 18 months, hugged her mama, came out of that trance, came out, the demons came out of her, and right there on the dirt, all three of them bowed their knees and they knelt down and gave their life to Jesus. Now you can't tell me, uh, you can pray all day, Buddha, oh, Buddha, in, in Buddha's name go. In, no, no, nothing's going to happen. And more demons have come. <laughs> Ain't nothing leaving, more coming. But when you pray in the name of Jesus, sickness will go. You say, well, I don't know if that works or not. Well, we got people up in this ministry. We got people that have been in this ministry that have had cancer that don't have cancer anymore because we prayed in the name of Jesus. My mama, sitting right there, had a brain tumor, was, was, was going to die. She was six weeks in a coma, but the Lord gave my dad a word. And there are also many other things which Jesus did, not Muhammad. Come on. Not Allah, not Buddha. There are also many other things which Jesus did, the which if they should be written, the world itself could not contain the books that they'd be written in. When God gave my dad that word, my dad stood on that word, and the next day my, my mom was totally healed, walking to meet the doctor. No more brain tumor. Come on, put your hands together. Hallelujah. Now, a man with an argument is at the mercy with a man with an encounter and experience. So you come too late to tell me Jesus won't heal. I can take you to a woman in California that was filled with AIDS, HIV. And the Lord told me to call her out by the word of knowledge. She was sitting over here, get, come out. You got a blood disorder. And the Lord said, it's AIDS and the Lord is healing you. She hadn't told anybody but the pastor and her husband. She had been raped on the USC camp campus. She'd been raped and contracted AIDS, but the Lord healed her right then. I did, I'm telling you, she was healed. She went to the doctor the next week, not a trace of HIV or AIDS in her body. Last time I talked to that pastor, I talked to that pastor years later. In fact, I've talked to him this year. She's still healed by the power of God. How many believe he's the same yesterday, today, and forever? So I want you to know that you're not going to get that anywhere else. It's not mind over matter. It's God over the matter. It's Jesus. And so as a sent dad, as a sent mom in your house, you have to teach your children that because somebody at school is teaching them something stupid. In fact, some of you might have to take them up out of those places and teach them yourself. 
People are getting educated and they're getting programmed to believe something that's a doctrine of devils. So you have to teach the truth. I mean, no, you shall know the truth and the truth shall set you free. How many want the truth? And it's not just the truth that you, you've heard about. It's the, tu- the truth that you know and apply. So you can't be good enough to get into heaven. You have to receive Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior. And you teach your children that. And you lead your children that way. And then from there, then you begin to recognize, I'm sent to my coworkers. I'm sent to my, my neighborhood. So everybody in your block, you sh- you're called there, sent to them to pastor to love. So you don't need Pastor Mac to come to pastor them. You need to pastor your block. You need to go out and do the work of a shepherd, of an evangelist, of a teacher, and say, not on my watch. This block is not going to hell on my watch. I'm going to be responsible. I'm going to be a watchman. I don't want their blood to be on my hands. So my neighbors, I'm going to go as a prophet, and I'm going to help them to receive their destiny. Now, you don't have to be a prophet. You go in the prophetic anointing. Now, you get that? You got that in your spirit? So what does that have to do with 2 Chronicles chapter 7 and verse 14? He said, if we humble ourselves and pray, turn from our wicked ways, what will he do? He'll hear from heaven. He'll heal our land, forgive our sin. How many want him to heal our land? Now, as we move into Acts chapter 13, we see that these people took this seriously. They were a people of prayer, a people of fasting, a people of worship. They ministered to the Lord. In fact, in this passage, you you can almost see, I I believe you do see, in, in a matter of four verses, most of what God has called this ministry to be. You see prophets and teachers gathered. You see apostles sent forth. You see people ministering to the Lord through worship and prayer and fasting. How many believe that's part of this ministry? And as a result, from this passage, from this moment, there was an apostolic sending that went forth that caused two-thirds of this New Testament to be written. From that moment, the Apostle Paul's ministry and Barnabas were sent forth to begin to go throughout the nations, throughout the churches, and you begin to see the advancement of the kingdom. What did they do? They fasted and they prayed. They fasted and they prayed. What did they do? They were sent ones. Everybody say sent ones. We got a lot of people that don't know how to be sent. They're went ones. They just get up and go. But you don't want to be a went one. You want to be a sent one. Uh, the difference is the seven sons of Sceva, they were went ones. They went out, but when they started dealing with devils, the devils, when they started to cast out the devil, the devil got on them. <laughs> they said, Gee, uh, they said, uh, said, we came here to, to cast the devil out in the name of Jesus whom Paul preaches. Come on, you can't have hand-me-down religion. You got to know Jesus for yourself. That's the reason Paul was able to cast out devils and heal the sick because he had an up-to-date, fresh relationship with Jesus. And so the seven sons of Sceva found out that you can't just throw around names. You have to know the one that you're throwing his name around. Amen. And so those seven sons of Sceva, they got their clothes ripped off of them, sent back home to their mamas with their tail tucked between their legs. (laughs) <laughs> because they were there preaching something that they weren't living. How many know you need to walk your talkie? Acts 13 in the message says, one day as they were worshiping God, they were all fasting as they waited for guidance. The Holy Spirit spoke, take Barnabas and Saul and commission them for the work I have called them to do. So they commissioned them in that circle of intensity and obedience. Remember that when we taught about that here? The circle of intensity. So they commissioned them from that circle of intensity and obedience, of fasting and praying. They laid hands on their heads and sent them off. 
And so this is what happens. If we want to see this deployment in the hour of the church that we're in, see people no longer just bobbleheads sitting in buildings, just giving mental assent of what's going on, but literally bringing change to our neighborhoods, bringing change to our cities. We're going to have to begin to move into this type of circle of intensity. Notice it was a circle. Most churches in America you are like this, and some of it's because we have to for the sake of space and such, but everybody just looks at the back of people's heads. You don't get to see anybody face to face. But they were in a circle of intensity. I believe that is a prophetic picture of where God is wanting the church to come. He wants us to be like knights of the round table. He wants us to begin to come together in a circle, put our sword down, and begin to say, how can we help each other to begin to fulfill the Great Commission? Everybody say commission. What is the Great Commission? Go into all the world, what? And preach the gospel, right? So we need to go into all the world. So how are we going to do that? Get in the circle, a holy huddle, of God's people and begin to impart to one another and hold each other accountable to see this happen. Psalms 127, turn there with me. Psalms 127, I'm not going to be much longer. Not going to be much longer. Got to catch a flight for real. Psalms 127, verse 4 and 5. Like arrows in the hand of a warrior, so are the children of one's youth. Happy is the man who has his quiver full of them. They shall not be ashamed, but they shall speak with their enemies in the gate. So we begin to recognize, just like this house has been known as legacy, and now we're stepping into that purpose of awaking the world, awaking Florida, awaking our world. We, we know that the only way to reach a, a, a city is generationally. Everybody say generationally. Generations. Genesis 22, verse 17. In blessing, I will bless you. In multiplying, I will multiply your descendants as the stars of the heaven and as the sand which is on the seashore. And your descendants shall possess the gates of their enemies. They shall what? They shall possess the gates of their enemies. And in your seed, all the nations of the earth shall be blessed because you have obeyed my voice. So, Taylor, you're, you and your husband and this beautiful baby, you, that's a natural representation of how you take the nations. What did he tell us? Be fruitful, multiply, and have dominion. That was the original intention of God when he put Adam and Eve in the garden. Be fruitful, multiply, and have dominion. So how do you take a city? You have children, naturally, and your children will speak at the gates. You're, I'm talking about the gates of the economy of this land. All the gates, the gates of education. How do you shift the education realm of Orlando? You raise up children that will become the educators. You raise up children that will sit on the school boards. Hello? How do you change a city? Instead of just trying to say, I'll fly away, oh glory, and get up and get out of here because the Antichrist is coming. No, raise up some people that will become the mayor or the commissioner or the senator. Hello? We, we as for years, we, we try to stay in a church and, and stay away from the world. No, we need to go change the world. So you raise up lawyers, people that will go and affect change in law. You raise up doctors, raise up prophets. That's what Joseph was. Joseph, he had an anointing to step into the business realm. Oh, glory. He was a Joseph. He was a prophet in the marketplace. We need prophets in the marketplace. I'm so glad y'all are joining me. It's, I can feel some of you coming on board now. It's like y'all left me hanging for 20 minutes. Welcome to Awake Florida. So glad you're here. I'm like, my God, who am I preaching to? So prophets in the marketplace. 
So I don't need just to have prophets in the pulpit. I need prophets that are literally go into their sphere, into their business, come on, and shift the market. This is important because for years we've separated. We say that we have this the sacred and the secular. But no, the sacred has to overtake the secular. Yes, there is separation of church and state. It means state, keep your fingers and your business out of the church. It doesn't mean church, don't, don't go into the state. No, every school in America, in the origination of America, started in a church. So who should influence the church? Who should influence the education? This word is how they started Harvard. Harvard started out as a Bible college. Now we've turned it over to Dr. Dumbbell, trying to teach us something that's anti-Christ. No, we got to take the schools back. Boy, I feel this in my spirit. We got to take the government back. We got to take the nation back. I'm telling you, in the next... The next few weeks, there will be a shift in this nation, the likes that you have not seen in a long time. The next few weeks, and from now through 2024, there's going to be a shift in the governmental realm like you have not seen in a long time. And abortion ain't the only thing that will be overturned. There's some other things that will be overturned in the coming years as a result of God's people rising up. Come on, who's going to rise up for the Lord? You say, that's that's being political. Well, if you'd read your Bible, it would bless you. Every prophet was sent to kings, to queens. Every prophet was sent, come on, to governors. Shikavahaya. So we didn't stay in our church and separate from the church. No, we were sent to the government to tell them, thus says the Lord. That's been the problem with the church. We've been afraid about losing our 501c3. Have it. Take it. God is my source. The government is not my source. Come on, lift your hands up. How many believe that? God is my source. How many know he's your source? Well, I'm going to lose my job if I stand up for Christ. Good. You'll own the business. You'll have another job. You've not, you're not a slave to fear. Come on, say, I'm no longer a slave to fear. I'm a child of God. That's more than a song. That should be a lifestyle. So I don't know what your political persuasion is, and I really don't care. I don't give a flip what you think about it. I only care about what this word says. Thou shalt not kill. That means do not abort babies. Uh, there ain't no way you can slice it or dice it. Well, that's not a baby. Well, that baby's not alive. Well, you you could you could tell me differently. I just looked just the other day. I got to see Judah swimming around in my wife's tummy. That's a baby. That's, he's he's alive. When I lay in bed at night, he's kicking me. Yeah, I get up. He's already trying to kick me. <laughs> I get up close to my wife and hold her. That baby's moving all around. I don't even know how she sleeps. <laughs> that is a living soul. Thou shalt not kill. Abortion is not of God. That's simple. That's simple. It, it took somebody full of demons to teach us otherwise. And it took us believing a lie to believe otherwise. And no, nobody, nobody would believe that unless they were under the influence of the enemy. That's why we got to stand up and be sent to change this world. And you say, well, abortion's already overturned. Yes, it is. But how many want to see it overturned in every state? That's why we need righteous people to rise up. And it's not just about abortion. Oh, look, look. I know this is going to flip people out. But, you know, God called a man and a woman to be married. Well, how can a child de decide How can a child decide whether they're a boy or a girl? How can you decide that? No, no, heaven, God already decided that. 
when you were knit together in your mother's womb, when you were born, you came out a boy or a girl. You didn't come out an it. You didn't come out trying to fix. No. And you got teachers in schools trying to tell kids that they can choose who they are. I have, I have been blown away recently. I filled out some type of application or did something for something, and they they said, "Are you? What are you designating? Who are who are you? <laughs> you're going to be?" I'm like, "What do you mean? I'm a man. <laughs> you're either a man or a woman. What? How do you designate?" Now, that's that's how messed up this world is without Jesus, without the Word. And we can come, no, I'm not going to be a hater. I'm not going to hate people because they don't know. They're just confused. And God can heal them. Amen. Amen. God can heal them. I've seen it right here in this church. Some of you don't know. Some of the people that were healed that were lesbians that came to this church that got delivered became elders in this church, got married and had kids, and they're doing great. Why? Before they came here, the enemy had blinded them to their destiny, but the Lord set them free, and they got healed, restored, raised up in this house as elders and sent out. Oh, come on, lift your hands. I've seen it. You come too late to tell me it's wrong. I've seen the Lord heal and restore many people and help people know what their real identity is in Christ. So I'm, I'm in a circle of intensity. Now I cannot hide. I don't just come into a big church and come in late and leave early. But now I'm in a family, and, I, and you, can, you can confront me, challenge me, and help me and hold me accountable so that I can fulfill my destiny. Who am I discipling? Who am I reaching? Who am I multiplying in? Now, if that happens, then from there, we can be sent forth to begin to take over whole cities. Say whole cities. Now, I believe we're in a shift right now in the earth. I've only got a few more minutes. We're in a shift right now in the earth, and the church is totally changing. It's going back to its original blueprints. I believe the church is going back to its DNA. There's a lot of stuff we do that we don't even know why we do it. It's like that old story with, with the, the young lady that cooked the ham and always cut the end off of the ham. I told it when I was here last time. Why'd you do that, Mama? They called her grandmama. She said, I don't know, called her the, 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 the great-grandmother, and she says, oh, shoot, honey, the pan was too small. That's why I cut the end of the ham off. There's a lot of people do things because they just have too small of a mindset. Your structure limits the flow of the Spirit. You Structures. So old wineskin mentalities. What did he say in the Word? If you have an old wineskin, you put new wine in it, it will burst. Right? Come on, stay with me. If you have an old wineskin, if you put new wine in it, it'll burst. So I can give you new revelation, and I can give you new wisdom, and I can speak to you, but it, and, and Holy Spirit can fill you, but if you keep the same structure in old wineskin, it's just going to burst. What are you saying, Joshua? I'm saying, okay, there has to be a shift in the structure of the church. The church has to change. The pandemic that we just went through, the whole thing, the whole plan of the enemy was to try to get the church to shut down. But God used it to rebirth the church in its original identity. God, he took what the enemy meant for evil, for bad, and is turning it around for the good. You say, well, Joshua, there's a whole lot of churches that close. Well, a whole lot of them needed to. There were mama called, daddy sent, but they were not sent by the Holy Spirit. They were doing something around a system and not around the Holy Spirit. There are large churches, large churches that have went through change, shifts, but many churches now are trying to go back to the way we did things before this pandemic, and they don't understand why it's not working. Why are people not coming back to church? 
Why are people not doing this? Because God wants the church to get up and get out of the building to go win the harvest. Stop fishing in the fishbowl. Let's get everybody to come to the fishbowl and let's fish in the fishbowl. No, you get people to come to the house to be equipped to be sent out. So we have user-friendly, seeker-sensitive, golden calf societies that call themselves churches. They meet together, but every week they give a message of salvation for the lost. No, that place is supposed to equip people to go win the lost. Amen. So it was never designed. That's why churches in America have went away from the Holy Spirit. We got a night for the Holy Spirit. We have a service for the Holy Spirit at best in spirit-filled churches today. But on Sunday, we gear all of our service around being seeker-sensitive for the seekers that come. Now, I read my Bible in Acts. They came out drunk on the Holy Ghost on the new wine. And the Lord added to the church 3,000 people, 3,000 men, not counting the women and children. I read in my Bible they, that after that, it just multiplied. There were 5,000 saved. So my service shouldn't be dumbed down so I can get people in the building to get saved. No, that's the problem. We're dumbing it down and everybody's just dumb and the church sitting in the pews waiting on somebody else to do it for them. No, we have to upgrade the church and equip the believers, equip people to go out and win the lost. And if a lost person comes in the building when we're preaching and we're praying in tongues and we're healing the sick and we're prophesying, they're going to be changed. Why? Because the Bible says tongues is a sign to the unbeliever. So if they happen up in one of our gatherings, that's, that's great. They're going to get challenged and changed. But I don't, I, don't, I don't change this and dumb this down and, and make it really quiet and peaceful and don't want to offend anybody so that I can get build a place. No, what you're doing is you're building an audience, not an army. You're building a crowd, not a church. The ecclesia of God is a governing body. What are you governing? What are we governing? If we are the ecclesia, that's what it means. The, the, the governing body or the governing assembly. He said, upon this rock, I will build my church. I will build my ecclesia, a governing body of people who will come into a territory and govern the atmosphere and say, no, not on our watch. You will not bring that into this city. Not on our watch. This city comes under the king's domain. How many want his kingdom to come? He said, when you pray, pray like this. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. That's not just a cute little prayer. That's not a religious thing. He says, bring my kingdom to earth. Bring my kingdom to Orlando. Bring my domain, my authority, my rule over the atmosphere. So if I'm a governmental church, an apostolic center, then like today in the worship, you started praying over the economy. That's good. You started praying over families. That's awesome. That's, that's what we do. We shift it. And not only that, we go out into this world we live in and we shift it wherever we're at in our spheres of influence. Smile at me. Show me where your teeth are at, where they used to be. Some of y'all looking at me like, If you love me so much, why are you <laughs> why are you yelling at me? I'm not yelling at you. I'm trying to stir you up. I'm trying to stir you up and say, you're not called just to sit in the nest as an eagle. You're called to soar. You're called to go. Go into all the world and preach the gospel. The first two letters of God's name is go. Go. Stop just coming to church. Be the church. Be it. So I think church looks way different than what we've seen. I think church in the New Testament is different than the way we call church. Church in the New Testament, according to Acts 2.42, they continued daily from house to house, 
what? Breaking bread, fellowship, the apostles' doctrine, and in prayers. The apostles' doctrine, breaking bread, fellowship, and prayers. Let me get it in order. Apostles' doctrine, breaking bread, fellowship, and prayers. And from that, you read on, it says, and the Lord added to the church such as should be saved. And from that, they moved from addition to multiplication, and the Lord multiplied them. They moved back into the initial and original blueprint of heaven, which was to be fruitful, multiply, and have dominion. How did they do that? They continued daily. Turn to your neighbor and say, daily. It became a lifestyle. It wasn't just Sunday. They became daily. They continued daily. Doing what? Breaking bread in a circle of intensity. They got to know each other. And from that circle of intensity, they continued in fellowship. Granddaddy Williams would always say, fellowship is a bunch of fellows in the same ship. <laughs> oh, how many of you have ever found out you can be in the same house and not be together? So you can't just be in the same building. you got to be in communion. And then from fellowship, what did they do? They continued in prayers. So I think we flip that. I think we try to bring all the church into the building, and we have five minutes of prayer in what's supposed to be called the house of prayer, and we just do five minutes in the middle of the service. Our benediction, everything, it might sum up in five minutes. Not this church, thank God, but a lot of churches, you have your, your beginning prayer, your benediction, your prayer over the offering, and you might pray for a few minutes. You might have five minutes of a whole service in a church that's supposed to be a house of prayer. Only five minutes is prayer, and we do that. But then I think the reason we're not able to move into a deeper level of communion in the Spirit is because we don't know each other. We know each other's back of your head. This is who I know of you, the back of your head. If you're looking at the back of mine, you got to pray for it, for it to be filled, some of that hair to be filled in. <laughs> That's all you know is the back of somebody's head. No, you need to get some FaceTime. And I'm not just talking about Facebook and your iPhone. I'm talking FaceTime. You need to know people. The Bible says know them that labor among you. How are you going to know them if they can't come to your house and eat? And you don't go to their house and eat. And you don't go out with each other and get to know each other. That's doing life. When you do life together, out of that, I believe true prayer takes place. Communion. For years, we've tried to make leadership and people mystical. We can't get to know people. But can I tell you, you're not a shepherd if you don't smell like the sheep. You're not a leader if nobody's following you. If you can't hang out with people, and get to know people, and all you do is get ushered into church and ushered out by your entourage, you're not a real leader or pastor. You're, if you've got a thousands of members church, there needs to be at least your leaders know you so your leaders can impart the heart to the people. You might not can know all thousands of them, but my God, I've been to some churches and preach, and their associate pastors don't even know their pastor. What's up with that? They just hire people, hirelings, put them on staff, do their duties, but no relationship. And this is why we don't change cities. But if we'll go back to the original blueprint, Acts 2.42, yeah, breaking bread in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship, then what's going to happen? The prayers will begin to happen. And out of that holy rumble of prayer, what happened in Acts 4? They prayed and the place was shaken. How many want the place to be shaken? So you can't, uh, this is what people try to do. They try to be spiritual without being relational. When I, I played football and basketball, one of the best things my coach ever did for us is have some fun time for us to hang out. For us to hang out and say, I don't want you to practice today. I just want you all to have fun. Y'all eat, y'all get to know each other, talk. All those guards and all the competition between us begin to move down, and we begin to be a team. We begin to be friends. And now I don't want nobody to hit the running back because he's my friend. 
I'm going to block for him. Come on, somebody. I don't want nobody to hurt this person because that's my brother. I have a relationship. I'm on a basketball team. I'm playing basketball. I, I don't want to be the only one to shoot and get my points and be a hot dog. I want to make the other team be good and play good and make points. Why? Because that's my brother and my sister. I'm not just after my stats. When did Kobe Bryant become great? Was, it, was he great when he started because he could do all the points and do what MJ did and put his tongue out the side of his mouth and slam? No, he was great when he became the floor general, when he began to see everybody and make everybody better. Why was Michael Jordan great? Because he could see people and make them better. Larry Bird, I mean, how, how do you help your team if all you are is you and you're four and no more and you come to church and you just get what you can and leave, you're a consumer. You need to be a contributor. Move from just consuming the anointing to contributing. How can I enhance Judah? How can I enhance Blanche? How can I enhance Calvin's life? Can I come with a word, with a hymn, with a song? Can I come with something this week to edify, to build up, to encourage? Now, through the week, you're picking up the phone, you're calling, you're praying for each other, you're in each other's life, and guess what happens? From that, real prayer can happen, real communion, real relationship. Because now I care for Blanche. Blanche just doesn't come to church. I don't just see the back of her head. Blanche is family. And if the enemy's picking on her, he's picking on me. Come on. From that, I begin to launch out and send and heal the land. You can't heal the land until you heal the house. You can't heal. He said, judgment must first begin in the house of God. So how, so what does that mean? Alignment, order, things that are out of bounds have to come into order in the house so that I can go and bring order to the city. How many want to bring order to the city? How many want to bring order to this land? Now, what I see happening I see God raising up his house in houses. I see multiple houses beginning to be set on fire. Homes, people's homes becoming beacons and lighthouses. I see your home, your church, your home becoming his house. And I see them all coming together as the ecclesia for gatherings, whether it's on a Sunday or it's another day of the week, and I see us coming together, and I see us having a barbecue. And I see us loving on each other and and playing volleyball and doing crazy stuff, and, and, and then from there beginning, go into a prayer meeting that shakes the world. I see people coming into your home, and they come into your home, and they can fellowship and let their hair down, and then after that, they move into a time of worship and you can minister to them. But it's got to start with some fellowship and relationship. What do you see, Apostle, for the church? I see a lot of the old, outdated, obsolete technology dying away. And I see the church going back into homes. Peter's house was built on two, three times. Remember that, Dad and Mom? We went there. It, they said that you could hold over 300 people in his house. So your house might have to get bigger for the people. <laughs> but what should you do? How can I make this practical for you? You should get your house ready to have a house meeting. You should host a meeting. You should have Pastor Mac, Dr. Yune come over, one of the elders come over, and then after a while you should be equipped and raised up and you should lead a meeting in your house. And, and there should be a time that, that we're touching this city from our homes and from our neighborhoods. Yeah, yeah. And then once a month, we should all come together. 
with the whole sense of urgency. We're coming here together today to cook out, but really it's incognito. We're in this park to win souls. And we're all going to cook out and we're going to offer some food to people and we're going to win people to Jesus. That's the church. That's the kingdom of God. It's not just a building with stained glass and steeples. It's the people invading our culture, our society, and healing the land. How many want to heal the land? Stand to your feet with me. I hope I've added a little bit to you. So I see a wake. I see a wake. Winter Park. I see a wake Altamont. It might be, it might only be by being in your house at first. But after a while, awake a Popka or awake a Koei becomes more than meeting in a house. And you have to say, you say, Apostle, we got too many people here. What are we going to do? We have to start stepping into a community center or something once a month to have an ecclesia meeting. Amen. Come on, lift your hands. And uh, awake a Popka and awake a Koei and awake uh, Winter Park and all these places come together once a month to worship, to take the heavens over the city. Oh, come on. And then once a month we all come together and we say, okay, where are our evangelists at? Come on, help us. Help us get out of our shells and go minister to people. Yeah. Do you see it? Now, I felt Holy Spirit say when I was here last time, he was speaking, and uh, Blanche started stirring the pot. She started asking questions, and I felt the Lord say to me, I need to come back and kind of unpack it a little bit more. So hopefully I've unpacked it a little bit. And if the Lord helps me, I'll be back in January. Good Lord willing, as they'd say, in the creek don't rise. Yes. I'll be back. Amen. So lift uh, your hands up towards heaven. We're, I just declare and decree over you right now that you've been raised up for such a time as this, that you've not been called just to sit in a building, but you've been called as a sent one to change your world. Say this when we say, we declare and we decree that this house is going to fulfill all the will of God. And this house will fulfill its destiny. We prophesy that each and every member will fulfill their assignment. We prophesy that we will be fruitful and multiply and have dominion in Jesus' name. Come on, put your hands together and lift up a shout. Now bow your head with me. If you're here today and you say, Joshua, I'm not where I should be with the Lord and I feel like today is the day that I make things right with the Lord. I want to make sure that I'm following him. I don't want to just be good. I want to make sure Jesus is my savior. I want to live for him. I want to pray for you. If that's you today, I want to pray for you. Just lift your hand. Say, Joshua, I'm here and I, I want to make sure I'm right with the Lord. Amen. Just lift that hand. Let me pray for you. Being good, being a part of any other religion is not what it's going to take. It's receiving Jesus as your Lord and Savior. Anyone else? Here, I see that hand. Thank you so much for raising your hand. Anyone else? Yes. Today is the day of salvation. If you raised your hand, if you want to come up here, I want to just pray for you and agree with you. Today is the day of salvation. In fact, why don't we just all declare this together? Say, Father God, I come to you now in the name of Jesus, and I ask you to forgive me of my sins, yes. to cleanse me from all unrighteousness. Yes. And I promise from this day forward, I will live for you. You've awakened me to your love. Now I will go and awake my world to your love in Jesus' name. Amen. If you prayed that prayer, whether you're here or you're watching online, welcome to the family of God. Come on, can we put our hands together and give the Lord praise? Amen. Amen. I'm going to 
come back in January, the Lord willing, and I believe the Lord's going to do some great things. And I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing what God does through the outreach of this house. Can I tell you, be faithful. Look at your neighbor and say, be faithful. Be faithful. Amen. I know you got, you got uh, caught up during the pandemic of wearing your pajamas and staying home and watching online. But if you get up to go to work, you can get up to come to this Ecclesia gathering yeah. and be trained and equipped. Amen. Yeah. Give it up.